With the attachment of Kavant 2, Mir was now truly a modular space station. The Soyuz TM-9 crew in orbit unloaded Progress M3, which had delivered replacement parts for Mir, including new storage batteries, electrical system components, and new computer parts. While working on the computer system, the crew awaited the arrival of the next module, Crystal. When Soyuz TM-9 launched, the Soviets stated that Kristall would launch on March 30th and dock on April 7th, 1990. On April 20th, the Soviets announced that Kristall would not be launched until June 1st. The cause of the delay was the continued work to turn over control of the Mir complex to the new Salyut SB computer. Difficulty had also been experienced in integrating Kavant 2's gyrodynes into the Mir attitude control system. These issues had made docking with Gavant 2 more difficult, and the ground wanted to avoid such problems. Part of the delay was due to the arrival of Progress 42, which was the last of the highly successful series of Progress vehicles. It marked the 43rd Progress docking, all of which were successful. The delay was because Progress 42 could only interface with the old Argon 16B attitude system. It departed the station on May 27, 1990. Soyuz TM-9, then docked to the front port of the multi-port node, moved around to the port on Cravant to clear the way for Crystal. At 3.30 on the afternoon of May 31, 1990, Kristall launched on the dependable Proton rocket. Crystal was primarily designed to investigate materials processing technologies in the space environment. The module also supported biological, earth observational, and astrophysical research. Crystal had 61 cubic meters of total pressurized volume and was divided into two compartments. The instrument payload compartment housed food containers and the industrial processing equipment. A 0.8 meter hatch led to the junction docking compartment this contained a spherical universal docking system with two APAS-89 androgynous docking units. These were designed with the Burian Space Shuttle in mind and were later used with docking with the U.S. Space Shuttle. A third opening on the end of the Crystal housed Earth observational cameras. Crystal was originally equipped with two solar panels that provided up to 8.4 kilowatts of electricity. Unlike the other solar panels in the Mir complex, these panels could be folded or unfolded, depending on the power requirements. Crystal also contained an additional battery, which would enable additional electricity storage. Six days later, on June 10, 1990, Crystal arrived at Mir. The first docking attempt was aborted due to an attitude control thruster failure.
The second attempt, conducted on June 10th, was successful. Like Kavant 2, Kristall used the Liapa arm to relocate the, to the lateral port opposite Kavant 2. This restored the equilibrium of the complex, which had been asymmetrical since Kavant 2 was placed at the lateral port in December of 1989. Balandine and Solovyov's mission was extended by 10 days to permit them to activate Kristall systems and to accommodate an EVA to repair the loose thermal blankets on Soyuz TM-9. Solovyov and Blinden had not previously been trained to perform an EVA at Mir, so they trained by videotape, sent up from the ground on a Progress spacecraft. They also observed practice sessions televised from the Hydra Basin down back on Earth. On July 3rd, they moved Soyuz TM-9 to the Mir front port so it could be more easily reached for repairs. On July 17th, they opened the Kavant 2 EVA hatch before the airlock was completely evacuated of air. When they did so, the hatch slammed back on its hinges. While outside, the crew used a pair of clamps, which they attached to handholds, to move down Kavant 2. They also secured themselves with long and short ropes, after an hour and a half, they reached the multiport docking node, attached two ladders to Kavant 2 to assist in reaching the damage on the Soyuz TM. After looking around, the cosmonauts determined that the Soyuz TM-9 descent module remained in excellent condition. Anyway, the thermal blankets had shrunk, making them impossible to reattach. They fell back on a contingency plan by folding two of the blankets in half. The long EVA put the crew well behind schedule, and the rated endurance of their suits of six and a half hours had been exceeded. They left their tools and ladders at the repair site and hurried to return to Mir. This meant crawling over Kavant 2's hull in the dark. They found that the Kavant 2 hatch would not close, so to permit them to re-enter the pressurized portion of Mir, the central compartment of Kavant 2 was used as an emergency airlock, something it was designed to do. The total time spent outside the station? 7 hours and 16 minutes. Later in July, the crew conducted a second 3-hour EVA to size up the damage to the hatch. Solovyov and Linden depressurized the Kavant 2 central compartment, and after several attempts to close the outside hatch from the inside, they televised images of the damage hinge to the ground, then returned to the multiport node to secure their ladders. Finally, they removed a portion of the hinge cover, which had broken and become lodged between the hatch and its frame, and they found it a lot easier to close after doing it. Two more Soyuz missions, TM-10 and TM-11, launched in the latter half of 1990. Soyuz TM-10 arrived with four additional passengers, quails. A quail laid an egg en route to the station and was returned to Earth along with 130 kilograms of experiment results and industrial products in Soyuz TM-9, which landed without incident. Soyuz TM-11 included Japanese astronaut Toyohiro Akiyama, and a camera installed in the descent module captured the reactions of the returning cosmonauts when they came back to Earth. The crew had no issues docking with Mir. On March 21, 1991, Progress M-7 broke off its approach at 500 meters from the aft docking port. On March 23rd, the same craft made a second approach, but at 20 meters from the upper rear port, ground control detected a catastrophic error and broke off the approach. The failure caused Progress M7 to pass within 5 to 7 meters of the station, narrowly avoiding antennas and solar arrays. 
When they had moved Soyuz TM-11 to Gavant, they noticed a similar failure that occurred on Progress M7 and had to manually dock to the station. On April 25th, TM-11 crew member Manorov filmed a damaged Kurz antenna on Gavant, and he reported that one of its dishes was missing. Soyuz TM-12 launched in May of 1991. At the time, Mir was experiencing electrical issues because of the station's changing orientation and the position of a number of its solar arrays. Late in May, the level of background noise on the station suddenly fell from the customary 75 decibels as fans, circulating pumps, and other equipment shut down. Lights began to fade. A computer in the orientation system had failed, preventing the solar arrays from tracking on the sun and causing Mir to drain its batteries. The veteran crew knew such problems were normal, and when it re-entered sunlight, the station was turned and able to recharge the batteries. On July 19th, the Soyuz 12 crew installed the Sofara girder onto Gavant. The Sofora was an automated assembly unit similar to the one installed on Salyut 7 in 1986. But the Soviets had plans to attach an attitude control thruster unit if it functioned as expected. The thruster unit would augment Mir's attitude control system. On the first EVA, the crew assembled three of the 20 segments planned for Sofara and continued building it on other EVAs. While in orbit, Hardliners in the Communist Party attempted a coup d'etat against Mikhail Gorbachev that rocked the Soviet Union and partially set in motion events which led to the dissolution of the Soviet Union on January 1, 1992. The event had a little immediate impact on Mir operations. Progress M9 was launched as the coup attempt fell apart on August 21st. Boris Belitsky, a Radio Moscow space and science reporter, stated, that ground control relayed broadcasts of Soviet Central TV, which was pro-coup, and Russian radio, which was anti-coup, to the crew in orbit. He stated that there were never any plans to abandon the station during the coup, but revealed that such provisions existed in the event of outbreak of war on Earth. After the arrival of Soyuz TM-13, one of the two Altair SR satellites drifted out of its geostationary position and was widely considered inoperative. The other Altair SR satellite, Cosmos 2054, continued to serve as a communications relay between Russia and Mir. The cosmonauts ended 1991 by replacing storage batteries and conducting ongoing repairs in the complex. At the end of the year, total solar array power production was down to 10 kilowatts. In addition, four of the six gyrodynes on Gavant 2 and one of the six gyrodynes on Gavant five of Mir's total 12 gyrodynes had failed. Interestingly, in January of 1982, as Progress M11 approached the station and the situation in post-Soviet Russia deteriorated greatly, ground control flight controllers were on strike for higher rates of pay, but that didn't interfere with the dock. Progress M11 boosted the complex into a 413 km by 380 km orbit before undocking and burning up in the atmosphere. Soyuz TM-14, launched in October of 1991, spent 175 days docked to Mir, and given the political changes at the time, the ship had launched from the Kazakh Soviet Socialist Republic of the Soviet Union and landed in the independent Kazakh Republic. Kazakhstan. During this period, NPO Energia representative B. Chertok stated the Mir station, by this time six years old, could no longer be mothballed. It would, he stated, doze off forever within two months without a resident crew. Despite making regular routine visits to the station, problems still did occur. Soyuz TM-14 suffered a landing system malfunction causing its descent module to turn over and it came to rest upside down, trapping its occupants inside until it could be righted. On September 11, 1992, 
The Soyuz TM-15 crew installed the VDU unit atop the Sofar girder and hoisted it into position. Soyuz TM-16, launched in January of 1993, was the first Soyuz without a probe and drogue docking unit launched since 1976. It carried an APAS-89 androgynous docking unit, similar to the unit used in the Apollo Soyuz mission in 1975. Soyuz TM-16 used it to dock with the androgynous docking port on the Crystal module. This was a test of the docking system in preparations for dockings with either the Buran or the US Space Shuttle. At 7.30 a.m. Moscow time on January 14th, Soyuz TM-17, which was connected to the forward port of the station, separated and maneuvered to within 15 meters of the Crystal module to begin photography of the APS-89 docking system. Ten minutes later, the pilot, Sibliev, complained that Soyuz TM-17 was handling sluggishly. Serebrov, standing in for photography in the orbital module, asked Sibliev to move the spacecraft out of the station plane because it was coming close to one of the solar arrays. In Mir, Viktor Afanasyev ordered Valery Polakov and Yuri Osakyov to evacuate into the Soyuz TM-18 spacecraft. Controllers on the ground watched the image of Soyuz TM-17's external camera as it shook violently, and Sarayrov reported that Soyuz TM-17 had hit Mir just before losing communication. Intermittent communications were restored with Soyuz TM-17, and inspection of the ship indicated no serious damage. Moving at such a slow rate, the cosmonauts inside Mir didn't feel the impact. The station's guidance system, though, did register some angular velocity and switch to free-flying mode. Later analysis indicated that the right side of the orbital module had struck Mir twice, about two seconds apart. The impact point was on Kristall, near its connection to the Mir base block. The cause of the impact was traced to a switch error. The hand controller in the orbital module which governed braking and acceleration was switched on, disabling the equivalent hand controller in the descent module. Dissibliev was able to use the right lever to steer Soyuz past Mir's solar arrays, antennas, and docking ports after it became clear that impact was inevitable. Over the next five months, the crew would keep Mir operational while waiting for the next component that would give the station much needed power, the Spectre.